Father God, we tell you thank you now for your goodness unto us, Lord God. We tell you thank you for your faithfulness, oh God. Lord God, we've come to study of your word tonight, Lord God. And Lord, we tell you thank you for the prayers that have been prayed, oh God. We thank you for inclining your ear to our prayers, oh God. And now, Father God, as we come to study your word, be with us, Father God. Give us your spirit. Uh, Lord God, pardon my feebleness, oh God. And Lord God, use me in spite of me. In the very name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And all my heavenly Father's children said, Amen. 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 Come on, give God another offering of praise. Amen. Amen. We tell God thank you for each and every one of you. We tell God thank you for the prayers that were prayed on tonight. Amen. Amen. Now, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Romans. On last week, we started the practical session of... Uh, the practical session of the book of Romans that began in chapter 12. We did one verse on last week, and we're going to seek to do just one verse uh, on this week. Amen? I was asked uh, earlier, I was asked earlier uh, this week, um, had the Lord given me, thank you so much, yes, yes, thank you. had the Lord given me a vision for, um, for 2019 yet, uh, had the Lord spoke to me about what the goal for the church 2019 was, and um, I told him no, but on tonight the Lord gave me a uh, gave me an inkling of what He wanted us to do next year, and that is to sit up front. Amen. <laughs> the, vision, the vision for 2019 is that y'all will sit up front next year. Oh Lord, I feel it in my spirit, Jesus. Let me change that. Let me change that to battery real quick. So, so on last week, I want to ask a question as we begin on tonight, and the question that I want to ask is, what does it mean? to be a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Anyone? And last week we kind of broke down verse 1 of chapter 12. And, and the question is, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Anyone? Give yourself to God so you can use it, that you can set apart so the Lord can use it. Amen, amen. Get lit. That's right. Anyone else? Like what you said, it's, it's yielding. Amen. And uh, will will yourself to God while you can do something. Don't wait till you get too old and Amen. you just you got to Amen. sit down. Amen. 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 Anyone else? All right. And so we saw him last week in verse, um, verse uh, chapter 12, verse 1, in the King James, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, brethren uh, by the mercies of God. So he really, he's really saying, when he uses, says that phrase, by the mercies of God, he's really saying everything that we've talked about, everything that we've looked at from all those doctrinal sections about how God saved us and how we couldn't save ourselves, all those things should be motivation for us to live our lives for God. Amen? And then, he, now, he said that you present your bodies. Now, it's kind of weird that he started that way, but he started by talking about what we should be doing with our physical bodies. He was literally talking about what we do with our physical bodies. Now, the reason why that's important, family, is because some may be tempted, listen to me, maybe some even here tonight, some may be tempted to believe that all of that, the only thing that matters is my heart. You know, you know how some of us say, the Lord knows my heart. Right, like the only thing that matters is my heart. As long as I believe right, I can do whatever I want to with my body. And there were people in those days and times that believed that. As long as my, as long as I have faith in Christ, I'm saved. Now, what I do with my body no, doesn't matter. Amen. So he begins by saying that what you do with your body does matter. Amen. Where you go does matter. How you talk does matter. All of those things matter. And so he challenged us, challenged us on last week that if you are really saved, it, the evidence ought to show up in your life. Amen? That it ought to show up in the way you talk to people, the way you uh, live. Amen? So, all of us should have found some, should have seen some area in our lives that we need to do better in. All of us know that we have areas in our lives that we need to do better in. Now, here's the thing. On this week, he's going to show us that this new life in Christ that is supposed to be lived out physically starts on the inside. Amen? That's what he's going to show us on tonight, that it starts on the inside, right? And so the empowerment to live on the outside comes from something happening on the inside. Amen? So we're going to look at five questions on tonight. 
And uh, those five questions, we'll talk about them and see if we can't come to some understanding of verse number two in our lesson. So uh, in, uh, to begin, in the former verse, we found that an inward surrender preceded an outward sacrifice and that the inner man, having been consecrated, uh, uh, having be, uh, been consecrated by yielding himself to God, was then called upon to manifest inward consecration by outward sacrifice. Right? And so then in the further exhortation in our verse tonight, we're going to see that the inward renewing of the mind is regarded as the prerequisite for a transformation of the outward life. What does that mean? That means that what you have going on on the inside ought to show up on the outside. Amen? And so then how do we get better about what we show on the outside is by doing some things on the inside. He says by being renewed on the, in our mind. So let's look at verse number two. Listen to what it says. It says, do not, it says, uh, I just found out, you know, I've been having this mobile control for a minute, but I just found out I can do this. So, um, <laughs> I'm about to point, I'm about to point out there. Uh, do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. This is the New Living Translation. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Do you see that? Again, do not copy the behavior and the customs of this world, uh, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Amen? So now, the first question that we want to ask tonight is what we left off on last week. And that question is, what does it mean to be worldly? Someone, anyone, you know, you can just, you can speak up however, uh, whenever you like, if you have a uh, thought on that. What does it mean to be worldly? Anyone? To behave like the world. To behave like the world. Amen? Anyone else? What does it mean to be worldly? Mm -hmm. Now. To live down. In other words, anything that you want to do that you feel like doing, you do it whether it's for the Lord or not. Right, right. Okay, so now, on last week, one of the things that we discovered, one of, one of the things that we discovered is worldly does not mean popular. Okay? Worldly does not mean trendy or fashionable. It doesn't mean that. Worldly means ungodly. Amen? Look what the Bible says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Now, it's, so when he, when he says that, he, he juxtaposes the world to, with Christ Jesus. And so what he's saying is that which is opposite of godly. All right? So worldly, when we say don't be worldly, we're saying don't be ungodly. Right? And so now what he's saying for us as believers, he tells us, do not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. Right? So he's saying that as believers, you are called to not act in ungodly ways. Right? So first of all, family, we know that the majority of our lives, we have spent our lives uh, learning the ways, the behaviors, and the customs of this world. Is that right? We, we know what it means to live ungodly. What are those areas? Anybody? What are, what are some areas in, your, in, in our lives that we are quick to act ungodly? What about in the way we handle stress in our lives? Right? What about the way we talk to people in heated situations? What about the way we resolve our arguments? What about the way we get ahead in life? Oh, see, all of these areas are practical areas in our lives where we learn. We need to learn how to do it God's way and not do it the devil's way. Amen. Right. So when it comes to let's just take let's just take getting ahead in life. When, when, when you when it comes to getting ahead in life, there's a way that the world says is all right. That God says no, you don't do that. Am I right about it? In, 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 in a godly way, you don't step on people in order to, to, to make a name for yourself. Right? In a godly way, you don't just uh, live and, you know, expose yourself all on the internet trying to get, get likes and through likes you get advertisement and through advertisement you get money. You see, that's the world's way of doing things. Right? But God has his way and it's not like the world's way. Amen? Amen. But nowadays, uh, when it comes to believers, sometimes that line is so blurry mm -hmm. that we act like the world. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say act like the world, I mean we use the world's method, all kind of ungodly methods to do things. Amen? And so what he tells us, so what, so what it means to be worldly is to be ungodly. It means to be, when he says, don't be conformed to this world, he means don't act like the heathen who do not know God. 
living by the rules of this world. Let's put some scripture on this thing. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. If you got it, if you get it, read it. Listen to what it says. It says, in whom, it's talking about, uh, verse 3 says, but if, if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them who, uh, who are lost. Watch this. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, family, do you see what he's saying? He's saying that there is a God of this world. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Satan. And now, again, when he says world, he's not talking about earth. He's not talking about universe. When he says world, he's talking about the systems of this world that is bent against God. Amen? The systems of this world that are anti-God. He's saying those systems are run by a higher power. They are a higher power. They are run by Satan. Amen? Amen? They are run by Satan. When the Bible talks about spiritual wickedness in high places, it's talking about the devil wants to influence those in high places to change the rules and the systems of doing things so that life will, that you will think it's all right to live a certain way, that people will be influenced by laws and by rules. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so then he says there is a God of this world. So what do we look like as believers mimicking what the God of this world influences, influences those who don't know Christ to act like. How do we look like acting like that? And say we know God. Say that we are influenced by another power. So to be worldly is to be influenced by the enemy. His ways of doing things. Right? Now family, it's a shame that when we come to church sometimes there's just as much fighting and bickering and cliques favoritism and uh, just as much that in the church as it is in the world. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, family. Yes. Right? Yes. All right. Um, 1 Corinthians 3 and 19. Watch this. This is going to bless you. 1 Corinthians. If you get it before I do read it. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written he taketh the wise in their own. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Like that's right. No, that's right. Okay. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Do you see that? It says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Right. So if we are trying to live by the, the standards or the rules of the world, that's foolishness to God. Amen. Again, chapter seven and verse thirty-one of that same of that same book. I'll read it. Chapter seven. Somebody get First John chapter two, verse fifteen through seventeen. 1 Corinthians chapter chapter uh, 3, verse uh, chapter 7 and verse 31 says this. Um, and they that use this world not as abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. Now that verse says that the things of this world are temporary. They're fleeting. They're passing. But the things of, of the kingdom of God are eternal. You see, family, love is a principle that lasts forever. Love is never fashionable one day, trendy one day, popular one day, and not the next. Love is always in style. It's always in style to forgive. Do you understand what I'm saying? But guess what? In order to in step on people to get ahead, you got to always watch your back. Look around. Look over your shoulder. Always wondering if this thing going to come back and get you. But when you love somebody and do it God's way, you don't have to worry about any of that. Amen. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? He says the world's way are temporary. They're, they're fleeting. They're passing. They will not last long. Amen? Amen? Now watch this. Let's break that thing down again. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 7, and 7 to 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world... All right. So, so love not the world, nor the things of this world. Now what, is, what does he mean by that? When he says love not the world, he doesn't mean don't love... The, don't like plants. Uh, don't, you know, don't make a God. No, he means don't love the ungodly systems of this world. Amen? Do not love the ungodly systems of this world. It, it calls to mind, Paul is in prison, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is in prison, and he's writing to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, he says, nobody's here with me. Because Demas, D-E-M-A-S, he was here with me, but he loved this world more than he did the ministry, and he abandoned me. You see, when the believer loves the world more than they love the things of God, you won't serve long, family. Right? 
Because the things of this world are what? Go ahead, John. Watch what, this, watch what the verse says. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. Here it is. All that is in the world are, is what? The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eye. The lust of the eye. And the pride of life. Do you see that? These are the things that mark ungodliness. The lust of the eye. Whatever, whatever I desire, that thing that looks good to me, that thing that I desire, I just go after it, no matter what God says. Right? The lust of the eye. What's next? The lust of the flesh. That whatever makes me feel good. Right? My flesh is controlled by what it feels, not by the Spirit of God. Not by the principles of the word of God, but whatever feels good to me is what I do. And then he says, the pride of life. I want to make something out of myself. Family, it's nothing wrong with making something out of yourself if you're going to do it God's way. In fact, if you do it God's way, the Bible says God will make your name grow. Am I right about it? But the problem is, we want to, because we want to be something so bad, we're willing to do anything, step on anything, sell drugs to our own people, steal from our own people, rob, kill, do anything in order to, to get ahead. And then, you know, we, 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 we'll, 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 we'll patch it up with words like this, you know, I'm just doing what I got to do. Right? But the Bible says that when it comes to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, that's the world's way of doing things, right? Whatever looks good to me, I go after it. Whatever feels good to me, I do it. Whatever makes me feel better about myself. You know, that, that actually has entered into the church now, right? Where most of our sermons, and listen, listen family, there is a place, don't, don't get me wrong, family, there is a place where we need to preach to, to people who are oppressed, people who are downtrodden, and lift up the low places. That's, it. That, 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 that's, 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 word, that's the word of God. Well, I do need to preach to you where you can be, where you can feel better about yourself and know who you are in Christ, but there is also must be that preaching that says you think a little too much of yourself. You need to humble yourself. There is also the preaching that says every scripture in the Bible ain't about you. And so every sermon that I preached ain't going to be about you. Do you understand what I'm saying? That you are not the center of the world. God is. Do you understand what I'm saying? The world does not revolve around you and your little world. Right? Do, do you understand that? And that all of your life cannot be focused on you. If you spend your whole life only focused on you, you're going to be forgotten about real quick when you die. Do you understand what I'm saying? But he's teaching us how to live a life that, that, that not only glorifies God, but has an impact on the world around us. That influences those around us. Amen? Because, because think about this. What if I feed the hungry? Right? And never feed the hungry in Jesus' name. So you know, you know what really what I'm doing? I'm making somebody comfortable on their way to hell. Just making sure your, 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 your journey to hell is smooth. No, but what we do, when we do outreach, we do it in Jesus' name. We tell them it's the love of Jesus Christ that, that the reason why we're here. When we knock on doors, we tell them we're not just here trying to make you feel good. We're here to show you the love of Jesus Christ. All that we do is for, is for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, now, I want to show you this acted out. This principle about worldliness. I want to show it to you acted out. Write this scripture down, and I'm, I'm going to tell you what happens in the scripture. You already know it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Watch this. The Bible says that Jesus says to his disciples, listen, brethren, I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem and die. I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem and die. And the Bible says, Peter rebukes Jesus. Now, you know that's already a recipe for disaster. Peter, the disciple, rebukes his Lord. And the Bible says that Peter says, not so, Lord. And you remember what, what Jesus said to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, watch this. This is the same Peter who, right before that scene, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ. Right? The son of the living God. And Jesus, and then Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father which is in heaven. Right? He, he, he lifts Peter up. On that confession, Peter shall the whole church be built. And then in the very next scene, 
Peter says, you ain't getting ready to die, Jesus. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He now encourages him for his confession. And in the next verse, he says, Satan is using you. Now, family, do you see how trivial and how finicky our lives is as believers? That at one moment, you can be influenced by the Spirit of God. And at the very next moment, it can be the devil influencing you. Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Watch it. Because you savor the things of this world of man and not the things of God. Meaning, the things that you hold in highest regard are the things of this world, the way the world does it. Right? And the world says self-preservation at all costs. Right? But that's not what, that's not, that's not God's way. God's way is not self-preservation at all costs. God's way is you need to put others before yourself. Service is God's way. Love is God's way. Sacrifice is God's way. Right? So question number one is what does it mean to be worldly? It means to act as people who don't know God. It means by living by the rules of this world. All right? So the next question is what does it mean to be transformed? Anybody answer that. What does it mean to be transformed? Anybody else? To be transformed, what does that mean? Change. To be changed. Okay. Okay. Cannot be what you used to be. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so Romans, uh, Romans chapter, um, our, our verse, our verse says this. Listen to what it says. It says, um, "Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person." You see, now, now I think it, it shows us that. Look what it says. Uh, oh, I got a point now. Watch. It says, but let God transform you. Here, here's, the, here, here's the key phrase. Into a new person. So, so if you look at the King James, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. So it, it, it juxtaposes two words next to each other. Conform and transform. And so my question is, is not conformity change? If you're going to conform to a certain standard, wouldn't that be change? So therefore, transformation cannot simply be change. Am I right about it? Transformation has to be something new. Transformation has to entail you becoming something totally different. Right? Because conform, uh, uh, to, to conform to something could be you just change on the outside. And that's the point that he's making. The point that he's making is, it's not enough for you to go to church on Sunday. The point that he's making is, it's not enough for you to have a religious talk. The point that he's making is, it's not enough for you to just change a few outward behaviors, but transformation has to start from the inside. You become, the Bible says, a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And how does that happen? It happens from the inside out. Somebody say, it's an inside job. It's an inside job. Now, family, here's, here's what he's saying. Listen to what he says. But let God. Somebody say, let God. Let no, God. no, 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 no. You, you, you didn't get that. Watch this. Let God. Now, what that means is, let God transform you into a new person by changing. That is a present part present participle, meaning it's an ongoing process. It's a gradual thing, but it's an ongoing process, meaning you are not the creature that God wants you to be yet. Irrespective of how long you've been saved. But there ought to be some transformation that took place. And I wonder, family, as you look at yourself, as you examine your own life, can you say that God has, is, is transforming me into a new creature? Is there some areas in your life now that God has transformed? Has he transformed your attitude? Is he transforming your attitude? Is he transforming the disposition, the way you look at the world? I'm gonna give you seven. I'm gonna give you seven ways that transformation can be seen in the Christian life in, in just a second. Um, but but just let me read this. Um, the Christian is not to copy the fleeting fashions of, of the present time, but to be wholly transformed in the view uh, of that higher mode of existence. 
in strict accordance to uh, accordance to God's will that He has chosen. So, 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 um, the question is, family, are you living a transformed life? Is your life being transformed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God? How many times have you been in church, heard the Word of God, and and and, and looked at your life and be like, "That's not how I live." Right? The, the Bible tells you to do this, or this is how a Christian should behave, and you look at your life and you have to say, I don't line up with that. Am I the only one that has that happening in my life? Right? So, so, so these are the areas that you should be praying about. These are the areas that you should be asking God about. See for see for me, I may I may have the attitude thing down. Well, well, I, I have the right kind of attitude. That got. No, I'm not saying I do. I'm just speaking hypothetically. Amen. Well, well, I may have that part down, but struggle in another area, right? And so then as the word of God is taught to me, right, as the word of God is brought forth to me and I examine my own life, what happens is I begin to discover things I need to pray about. Yes. I begin to discover things I need to meditate about in my own life. Yes. Am I right about it? But the problem is too many times when we come to church, when the preacher preaching, you think about everybody else that should have been there. <laughs> Right, like some of y'all here tonight looking at looking at looking at who not here and saying, Lord, they, they could have used that word right there. No, you need that word, Blair. I mean, uh, brother, sister. You need that word. Am I right about I need that word? Right? So, so 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 don't you dare sit in church talking about who need to hear this. Because if you hear, chances are you need to hear it. And all of us have areas in our lives that we should be praying about, meditating about, seeking God to help us see transformation in those, in those areas. Now, the proof, family, watch this. The proof that God can transform those areas that are yet to be transformed is look at all the areas that he's already transformed. Right. Am I right about it? Which one of y'all desired to be in church when it was raining outside? Amen. But yet you have a desire to be in Bible study. Yet you had a desire to be in prayer meeting. Do you understand what I'm saying? God has transformed your desires. Yes. Right? He has transformed the way you see things. Look, listen. I, I, I challenge us to transform the way we see life. The way we see things. To have more of a Christian worldview and more of a Christian perspective. Rather than seeing how negative your family is, how much mess and drama is in your family, I dare you to see it as an opportunity for you to share the love of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? Rather than looking at your job as, as, as a, oh my God, I gotta go back to this job. I, I'm talking to myself. Well, I gotta go back to this job. I gotta clock in again. Remember, that's how you're, that's how you're taking care of your family. So no matter how hard it is, God has blessed you with an opportunity, a means, a method, a way of taking care of your family. Right? That's the reason why he's going to say later on in this chapter that we ought to be grateful for those things, for our jobs, for our employers. Be grateful that we live in. Now listen, I know, I know America's kind of, kind, of, kind of messed up, right? We look at uh, 45 and be like, Lord, Jesus. But I can guarantee you, even with 45, you'd rather be in America than some other places. Yes. Hello, somebody. Am I right about it? Yes, sir. So, 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 so watch this, family. So it is a, watch this. It's not simply, last week we talked about presenting our bodies. That is a change of behavior. Presenting your body to Christ is a change of behavior. But presenting, but, but in this thing, he's talking about a transformation that starts from the inside. So the way I change what I present my body to is, is to change what I'm thinking about. Yeah. It's to change how I'm, what's going on on the inside of me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what is that? That is a change of character, right? That, 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 that is a that is a, a, a change of, of, of my nature. My very nature has to change. Am I right about it? And that's what God has done through Christ Jesus. He changes our character. He changes our nature. And with that, he also changes our behavior. Amen? Now watch this, family. I want to, I want to share with you seven, seven uh, ways that transformation uh, can be seen in the Christian life. The things that you surrender to, right? Think about what you surrender to now versus what perhaps you once surrendered to. Transformation can be seen in the life of the Christian through, uh, by service, the service that you give. 
It can also be saying, in the way you love. Is that right? Transformation can be saying, in the way you love. Watch this. Transformation can be seen in a Christian's life by the way they deal with their trials and tribulations. Right? You remember how once upon a time you just got nagged out, man? Any little thing that happened, just nagged you out. Soon as trouble, problems come, you just got nagged out. But look, you've learned to take the word of God and allow it to transform you because you, you remember certain scriptures that says that these trials come to make you strong. That they work patience, they work faith, they work hope, they establish you, right? And so you begin to look at those, at your problems differently, why? Because you were being transformed, right? You know once upon a time when you go through this, some certain things in life, you, in, you didn't have the positive perspective that you have now. That's the work of God transforming you into what he wants you to be. Transforming you into a model. You know what they do with models, right? They put their clothes on, right? That right says, no need to serve certain brands. They put their clothes on that model, and that model walks that runway, and everybody can be can see that that their clothing line and be like, you know what? I think I'm gonna buy that. I like the way they look, right? What about when you walk? When they see you walk, they be like, ooh, I want some of that patience right there, man. When they see you walking, they be like, man, let me have a little bit of that. I, Lord, let me get some of that. I want, a per I want some of that joy, Lord. But why? Because God has put you on the runway of life. Oh, and says, walk, walk that thing out, man. Show them what I can do in a believer's life. Oh, Am I right about it? Oh, yeah. it, 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 it they, they, they watch this family. Transformation can be seen in, in a believer's life through our world view. How do you view the world? Is the world all about politics? Is it all about Democrats, Republicans? Or do you see God working even in that? Amen. Right? Think about your day-to-day -day life and how you view your day-to-day -day life. It, do you see a, a spiritual perspective in that thing? Do you see God working in all things? Or is it just some physical, you know, you, you're so compartmentalized that one part of your life is physical, one part of your life belongs to God, one part of your life belongs to you, another part of your life belongs to this, or is it all God? Them, 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 they got some, some boys from the streets that just, you know, they, they, they get saved and them boys get radical for Jesus and start saying, like, oh, God, everything. <laughs> now, I see God in everything, right? And so then watch this. Another way that transformation, watch this. Another way that transformation shows up in a believer's life is in the community that they have. Hello, somebody. You ought to desire. Listen, don't tell me you love God, but you hate his church. Right. With all of the problems that the church has, right. with all of the issues that the church has, the only reason why the church got problems is because you're here. Right. <laughs> Am I right? Amen. If you weren't here, we have one less problem. All right. All right. If I wasn't here, we have one less problem because I'm sinful. All right? right? So all of us, as we join join this body of believers, this community of believers, we bring our own little issues, little twerk, little quirks, little uh, bad. I said twerk, little bad, <laughs> little bad, wrong way of seeing things. We all bring that to the table, family. Yeah. Right? Am I right about it? Yeah. But guess what? We are the best God got. Yeah. We are who God chooses to use. Right. right? And so, family, you ought to desire a community of like-minded believers. Right? You shouldn't desire to be to be surrounded by people who don't love God. You ought not be comfortable. I'm not telling you that, that you have to uh, run away from those settings. I'm saying you ought not be just comfortable in those settings. You ought to desire a community of believers. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, uh, it, it, the, the acts that you do, the right acts, the right acts, that's one of the ways that transformation should be able to see in the believer's life. Now, family, question number three is, how does, uh, what is the danger of being conformed? What is the danger of being conformed to this world? Conformed to the wrong thing. That's exactly right. You be conformed to the wrong thing. Anybody else? The danger of being conformed to this world. What about you lose your witness? Mm -hmm. You lose your, your Christian effectiveness mm -hmm. when you talk like the world, act like the world, behave like when you do those, you lose. Don't nobody want to hit, hit them in the you, you ever seen people like that? You know, they start talking about Jesus. As soon as they talk, start, as soon as they start talking about Jesus, somebody be like, "You should have seen him yesterday, though." 
One time about Jesus last night. They was throwing up last night because they were drunk, right? All right, next question. Watch this. How does, uh, how does changing the way I think transform my life? Isn't that, isn't that self-explanatory? Yeah, if you Is it? New stuff, a new thought pattern. If you think different, you will act different, right? The Bible, the Bible teaches us this. The Bible teaches us that the, that, that the reason why we act the way we act is because we think the way we think. But if we can change the way we think, we can change the way we live. It, think, think about if money wasn't everything to you. Can you, can you imagine how, how much differently you would live if money wasn't the end all, say all of everything? If you wasn't the center of your world, can you, can you imagine how much more different you would think? Philippians chapter 4, read that. And at the end of Philippians chapter 4, it tells us how we should think. What sort of things are lovely, are, are, are worthy of, of good praise, worthy of good report? What sort of things are, these are the things that we should be thinking about. Right? So if we change the way we think, we can change our lives. Now, how do we change the way we think for God? Well, we already know it. Through the Word of God and through the Spirit of God. So when you come to Bible study and you're taking all those notes, what you doing with them when you leave here? Allow that to change the way you think, family. Go back over it. Look, look over it and, act, and and begin to apply it to your life. Find one thing on the notes that you're taking, one thing from the, from the study tonight. Take one thing away from this that you need to apply to your life and be intentional about applying that particular thing to your life. What is it that has convicted you? What is, what is it that has stepped on your toes and through the preaching or teaching of the Word of God? Sunday school class. What is it that the teachers have taught that stepped on your toes, that challenged you, that you need to do better? Take that one thing and be intentional about letting it show up in your life. Pray about that one thing. Try to act on that one thing. You understand what I'm saying? This is the way we begin to transform our lives from the way we think. Right? All right. Now, here's the last thing. Let me say this. When he says transform your life by the renewing of your mind, that renewing of your mind in the King James, that renewing of your mind means that your mind is acting under a different influence. That's what it means to think differently. It means to have a different influence. All right? Now, family, here's the last thing, I, and, and, and I really want to share this with you. Hope, I hope this will bless you. What is God's will for your life? And we kind of we hit on this Sunday, but I want to share this with you. What is God's will for your life? That we will all be saved. Okay. Anybody else? All right, so... That, so Go ahead, Sue. And that uh, to, when we become saved, that we will want others to be saved and will go out and tell them and try to influence them to be better in their lives as well, I think, way out in even people we don't know. I don't like. I don't like you. <laughs> so look, the verse said, watch the verse. I want to read in the King James. It says that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So first of all, what it says is that the will of God, there, there's some areas in your life that you're going to learn what the will of God for your life is as you live, right? So it's not just, this is the will of God, and now I can go and do it. It's not always that clear. You understand that? Some areas it is. So how do we know the will of God for our life? Watch this. I'm going to give it to you. Make it real plain, real practical. And this is, this is going to close out our time together, all right? So how do you know what the will of God for your life is? Number one, you start with what you know is God's will. Uh, do you understand that? You start with what you know is God's will. What do you know is God's will? Well, well, the Bible tells you it's God's will, blah, 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 blah. Here it is. What do we know is God's will? We know, number one, for Simpson, it's God's will for us to be saved. We also know that it's God's will. This is all Bible. We know it's God's will to be spirit-led. We also know that it's God's will for us to be sanctified. That means living out our Christianity. We are, listen, we also know that it's God's will, watch this, for us to suffer for Christ. Do you understand that? I know you weren't going to say amen on that, but that's, that's in the Bible. It's God's will that we suffer for Christ. That means for righteousness sake. That don't mean that you've done something wrong and now you're suffering the consequences of your actions. That's not suffering for Christ. Suffering for Christ is when you've done right and wrong happens to you. So that's God's will for you to suffer. And then listen, it's also God's will for you to be submitted to him. That's the Bible. 
The Bible also says this. Watch this. It's God's will for you to say, be grateful in every season of your life. It is God's will for you to say thank you. That's the Bible. So those are the things, that those are the, the explicit things that the Bible says is his will. For you to be saved, for you to be spirit-led, for you to be sanctified, for you to be suffering, submitted, and saying thanks. I put all the S's on that joint so I can make it easy for you. But then what do you do with the unknown will of God? Who should I marry? That's the unknown will of God. Somebody asked me that today. Right? That's the unknown will of God. What do you do then? Watch this. Here it is. Listen to me. The unknown will of God. What do you do? First of all, you look at the principles of Scripture. The principles of Scripture. Then you look at the promises of Scripture. Right? I will never leave you nor forsake you. The promises of, uh, the promises of Scripture. Uh, I will bless the work of your hand. Right? And then, and then the practices, some of the practices of Scripture. Well, how did godly people in the Bible, how did they do this? How did they respond to this? How did they act toward that? And then prayer, and then the providence of God. Can I tell you what that means practically? Can I tell you what that means practically? It means there are some things that you ought to know is God's will. It's God's will for you to pray. It's God's will for you to be grateful. You know that without a shadow of a doubt, right? But then, in other areas, listen to me, family. In other areas of your life, you have got to make a decision. You pray, talk to God about it, and you make a decision. Why? Because guess what? If you, if, if you make a decision, something ha something you're going to have complications no matter what decision that you make. But if you pray, you made a decision, then guess what you got to do? You got to leave. We are not, I'm finished with this statement, family, we are not automatons. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, God, treat me like I'm an automaton or a robot. Maybe I should just say robot. Uh, uh, one, on one hand, you want God to treat you like a robot. Just keep me away from the bad and just show me all the good. But you're not a robot. God has given you free will. So you start with the known will of God, and when it comes to the unknown will of God, you pray, you look at the principles of Scripture, you seek godly advice, and you make a decision. You receive that word tonight? Amen. Lord, we tell you thank you for your word, God. We tell you thank you for your people. As we go into our uh, business week on tonight, Lord, be with us. Let our time together be fruitful, God, in Jesus' name. We tell you thank you for all your goodness and all your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen